And welcome to Lake Kick is live. It is Sunday night, January 23rd, the year of our Lord, 2022. So happy to work alongside the NFL to time this up right at halftime. Dare we call it a halftime heat edition of Late Kick Live. We are jam-packed. We are high atop downtown Nashville, Tennessee. So much going on with the portal. If you're watching the game, you probably missed a bombshell out of the portal. It's not Caleb Williams. It's not Jackson Dart. But it's uh, on the tier right below that. We're going to talk about that also just in general. How much college football is changing? What the transfer portal has done? I know people talk about this in the abstract. I was, I was at the gym earlier today, and there were a couple of guys, combined age, about 377 years old, and they were talking about how the transfer portal just changed college football. How? I didn't press them against the wall on it, but we are going to talk about it because of the inspiration that I was given in the locker room of the YMCA here in Nashville today. Uh, so we're going to have that. We're going to have specific portal updates. We've got the Mood Tracker series rolling on. We're going to do South Carolina tonight. All that plus two very spicy questions from the Late Kick inbox. We're going to hit some Q&A. Make sure you're following on Twitter, at Late Kick Josh, because there's so much popping right now. We're doing two live shows per week, but we're getting very close. Probably this week, actually, we're getting very close to slightly adjusting or tweaking our schedule. And that doesn't mean taking stuff away. That probably means adding a thing or two. So make sure you're following there. And also, we're having a lot of fun right now. I'm tweeting out my video of the year nominees. As you know, I'm on the sideline for big games every week and got the eye josh there. So I get some really good footage. And you saw it during the year. But sometimes you forget from earlier in the year what all we had and what we had access to. And as an audience, what we got to see. So I'm putting out one or two videos per day. And I think eventually when I empty the entire arsenal, we're going to have to vote on what the best videos of the year were. Boy, we're so blessed to have some incredible vantage points on Saturdays. So uh, make sure you're checking that out, at Late Kick Josh. All right, let's go. Let's dive in. Let's waste no time. College football, she's a changing right now. And you can argue for the better or for the worse. You can be totally indifferent on this. But for a long time, here's one thing we did know. For a long time, if you fired your head coach and then you cleaned out your coaching staff, there were a couple of things that you could pretty well take for certain. And one of them was... You've got a rebuild on your hands. With limited exceptions, you're going to have a rebuild on your hands. You've certainly got to get a head coach, and that's a crapshoot in and of itself. And then he's got to go, and he's got to get a great staff in, and there's no real good time to do it because you've got a firing happening right in the middle of recruiting season. And so you got all that mess. And then once you get everything in, and everything's settled, and you know who the head coach is, and you got your coordinators, and you got your strength and conditioning coach, and all your position coaches filled out, then you got to worry about the entire premise that was the reason for firing the previous staff to begin with. And it's probably that the program wasn't in a good spot. LSU football was not in a good spot. They fired Ed, they brought in Brian Kelly. USC football was not in a good spot. They fired Clay Helton, they brought in Lincoln Riley. What that used to mean is, even if you're excited about the hire, once upon a time, Alabama hired Nick Saban. They still went seven and six the next year. It used to mean that no matter how big a grand slam you hit in the hiring process, it's going to be a little bit of a rebuild. So you're going to have to have some patience, and we're going to have to turn this thing over. And here's the important part. We're going to have to turn over, and it's not going to happen overnight. Things have changed. Things have changed drastically and violently over the past I'm going to speak in terms of months, 24 to 36 months. It's really changed drastically. I'm not here to debate tonight whether I like where we are. I'm not really here to try and kind of um, prod you into debating whether you like what the transfer portal is doing or you don't like what the transfer portal is doing. Let's put those opinions to the side because we've got plenty of time in what some casuals would call the offseason to debate that. What I want to do tonight is just accept the facts for what they are. And then I want to ask you, do you get what's going on right now? Look around. Look at what LSU and USC specifically are doing. But you could throw Ole Miss in here. You could throw a number of programs in here. But I'm talking about programs that have made coaching changes. Kiffin was at Ole Miss last year. Lincoln Riley was not in Los Angeles six months ago. Brian Kelly was not in Baton Rouge six months ago. And now they're there. And what used to mean, take some time, be patient, we got to rebuild, has totally been turned on its ear. These numbers are staggering. I know a lot of you are in tune, if you've been keeping up with the day-to-day -day of college football, you're in tune with the fact that LSU's made a lot of moves in the portal. Certainly, we are constantly watching USC, even up to and including this moment, because we're trying to find out if Caleb Williams is going to Southern Cal and when is it going to happen, but we don't have to wait for that. Uh, if you look at the transfer portal rankings, which are on your screen if you're watching on YouTube, LSU and USC 
are one, two there. Ole Miss has knocked it out of the park. They may not be done. Arkansas, certainly not done. They've made another addition as recently as today that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Guys, I'm going to hit you with some numbers here. I want you to think about telling your 1997 self this or, or tell your 2007 self this. Imagine me telling you USC is going to replace their head coach. That's not breaking news. I mean, USC's done that before. You know they're going to do it again. But I want you to think about the numbers I'm about to hit you with. Think about what's possible now because of the transfer portal. Do you know that since Lincoln Riley took over at USC, they have had 20 kids exit the program via the transfer portal. They have had 11 come in the door and they're not done. The biggest of which could still be out there in Caleb Williams. They've added, I wanna say six of them this week. Uh, they've been on fire and these are impact players. Uh, they got Die, the running back from Oregon. As I said, Caleb Williams, you're waiting any minute to hear that news. Mario Williams, the wide receiver from Oklahoma. Think about the numbers there. If you add that up, that is 31 kids, both in subtraction and addition, that's half your roster that you've turned over. They're not even to spring practice yet. Sark is doing this right now, transitioning from his first year to his second year at Texas. It's not a overnight rebuild, but it's all not, it's really not all that far from that. Really, if you think about the, the quantity, the percentage of your roster that you can turn over. What about LSU? LSU has been killing it here too. LSU has seen 11 guys exit so far. Now, some of these are not committed yet. So technically they could come back. You would think that in all likelihood, if they have exited because a new regime is in place, it's either because they didn't see eye to eye with them or that new regime not so subtly told them, you probably need to look elsewhere. There's probably not going to be a place for you here. So LSU's seen 11 exit or either enter the transfer portal, and then they've had 11 come in the door. And these are impact players too. Now, the benefit when you hire a guy who's got a lot of miles on his tires like Brian Kelly is he's had to do it several ways. Uh, there's no guesswork. There's no one way he got there. Brian Kelly's had different teams with different skill sets. He's had different kinds of quarterbacks, different kinds of backfields, different kinds of defenses. And so he, in other words, is able to come in and assess, here's what we have right now. Uh, let's see, I remember 2013 or 2017. That's my most comparable data point for a team at Notre Dame relative to what I have here. Now, how did we do it then? All right, then you fill in that blank. Then you say, go find me the players that fit the kind of critical factors that we had on that team. He's got Polian in there right now, by the way, who is doing a heck of a job. It's a very underrated hire. I was over on Go247, the board today. A lot of them were talking about that hire. They are right. That's also what a lot of coaches behind the scenes have been talking about. Uh, player personnel has always been important, but because you now have to have a college scouting apparatus attached to your college program, which you didn't need five years ago even, it's even more of a big deal. I do not think, as a result of what we're talking about right now, we have seen a peak in coaching salaries. A lot of the behind the scenes talk about the coaching world is always who's going where, but it's also who's gonna get paid what, and when are these exorbitant coaching salaries, when are they gonna crest? Like when are we gonna see that flood stage reach its crest, and then when are the, when are the salaries gonna to start to recede a little bit? When's that bubble gonna pop? I don't know, I just don't think it's happened yet. In fact, I think if we're looking on average, three or four years down the road, the average major head coach's salary is probably a little bit more inflated. And if it's not an outright dollar figure, certainly when you count the perks that are built into that contract, it will be more inflated than it is right now. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on a question about Kirby Smart and what his true value should be right now. But if you think about coaching salaries, and you want to know if they've peaked or not, or if they're just going to keep skyrocketing, I would lean towards the latter scenario. And I'm going to tell you why. Quite simply put, whether it makes you feel like you need to take a shower or not, no coach has really ever had this kind of leverage until right now. Now you can look at it that way or not look at it that way, but coaching salaries are going to keep going up because no coach or collectively no uh, group of coaches have ever had this kind of leverage. It used to be that if Lincoln Riley left Oklahoma for USC, that's tough, but he's got a rock solid program there and we will have very little issue replacing him. Now they got Brent Venables, they got their guy there, but it used to just be when the coach is out the door, he and his staff are out the door. Now it can be if the coach is out the door, the quarterback, best two wide receivers, a couple of all American corners, they could all be out the door. And that, even though it's not meant to be this way, 
could be the kind of leveraging tool that you've never seen before exist in college football. Is it the way it's intended to work? No, it's not. Is it abusing the system? I'm sure folks in Norman, Oklahoma would say, yes, it is. Uh, I've got to tell you now on the back end of this, my opinion is I don't like it. I don't feel great about it. And I also have never been of the opinion that this is going to balance out the sport. I've never been of the opinion that NIL, nor will the transfer portal balance out the sport. We're going to talk about it more in just a second. Uh, but as I told you before, not here to really litigate my opinion on it. It's kind of an it is what it is sort of scenario to kick off the show tonight. But just think about what Lincoln Riley is showing and what Brian Kelly is showing is possible from a roster standpoint. Now, they haven't played games yet. They haven't even gotten to their first spring practice yet. But that's just my point. Already, you've seen a critical portion of the USC roster get overturned. Ditto. You've seen a critical portion of the LSU roster get overturned. We've never seen anything like this before. Uh, there are upsides. There are downsides. It just it does give you a level of excitement probably if you've got a new staff in the house that you've never had before. And conversely, if you start to hear whispers and rumors that your coach could be on the move to another college program, you're biting your fingernails down to the nub because it could just gut your roster in a moment's notice. And there's really nothing you can do about it because if they choose to leave you, what are you going to do? If there's really no amount of money you could have thrown at him, if he's leaving you regardless, you better hope that there's just an infinitely higher character in him than 99% of coaches out there where he says, you know what, my old roster's off limits. I'm not touching those guys. Oh, uh, that's, that's idealistic. Unfortunately, this is a realistic world that we live in. And because it's realistic, you can try and fit as much idealistic principles in a realistic world as possible. And that's why Academy Sports and Outdoors exist, really. I got them. Colin, there's no way they knew that was coming. There's no way I seamlessly transitioned into this. And because of that, you have to watch this. Academy Sports and Outdoors is the only partner that we have on this show. We love it. I got an email from our buddy Dan Davidson. He doesn't mind first and last name being shared. Uh, he is a viewer that is in frequent contact with the show. And he emailed me today. And he gave me a list of the shows that he watches, podcasts and shows that he listens to and watches. And he says, look, I can clearly tell you I like the show. That's why I tune in. But one of the things I like about the show now that I have tuned in is all these other shows have like five or six ad breaks and your show has one ad break and it is so effective in keeping me tuned in. I have shopped at Academy Sports and Outdoors because they negate the need for you to have 14 other ad breaks in the show. That is a great value proposition as we would call it in the business. And that is what I told the folks at Academy I'm going to do with the majority of these ad reads. Sure, I could show products. I could have an entire line of t-shirts over here. I could have winter gear over here. I could have all sorts of different baseball equipment because baseball season is about to get underway this spring, especially the further south you live. But why do that? You already know about that. Why don't I just tell you about the behind the curtain inner workings of this show and the fact that the only thing that keeps us from going another 15 minutes because we have to do multiple ad reads is Academy Sports and Outdoors stepped up before the season and they said, We'll just take it all. You know what? We'll just step up and we'll write the check necessary to keep the lights on in there. Uh, by the way, keeping the lights on in this building lately has been a chore and Academy has done it, but Academy also is our exclusive partner. That's ideal. It's ideal for us. It's ideal for them because I love getting to this part of the show and knowing I'm going to tell you a few great things about Academy Sports and Outdoors and then we're done. And the rest of it is just meat unless we fumble the ball terribly and that's not Academy's problem. But look, if you don't have an Academy Sports and Outdoors in your backyard or in your neighborhood, that's fine. Academy.com. That is specifically what God created Academy.com for. So no matter if you live in Washington State or you live in Miami, Florida, or you live out in Tucson, or you live up in Augusta, Maine, anywhere in between, Academy Sports and Outdoors or Academy.com, one or the other, will fit the bill for every single thing that you need. Okay, now we got to draw it right back down to earth. The transfer portal's on fire. 37th time this month I have started a segment like this. I'm going to hit the two big names immediately because as of our live broadcast right now, we don't have updates on Caleb Williams. Now, what we do have is we do have other movement going on at USC. Uh, Romello Height was an edge rusher from Auburn, banged up this past year. They didn't get a lot of production out of him. USC just brought him on board today. Uh, still no Caleb Williams, though. We are still waiting for the official transfer destination of the five-star quarterback from Oklahoma. But here's what's funny right now. If you follow the USC football account on Twitter, you know that like many other programs, they have a certain thing that they like to do when they get good news. 
So either a high school commitment, or in this case, if they know a transfer portal guy has officially inked with them, they know a little bit ahead of time. So the USC Twitter account just simply tweets out the deuce emoji, fight on, and therefore you know something's coming. Well, here is the problem there, classic conundrum. Everybody is on pins and needles waiting to see what Caleb Williams does. And USC has gotten half a dozen transfer portal commits this past calendar week alone. And so they've put out half a dozen of those fight on emojis and every time your phone blows up, Caleb must have committed, here comes Caleb Williams, and then you look and it's, oh, it's Travis Dye. Oh, 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 it's Romello Height. These are still big time additions, but yet it's so anticlimactic. And so you start to ask yourself, is there going to be a telltale sign? When they finally put out that fight on emoji, elsewhere known as the deuces emoji or the peace emoji, when they finally put that thing out there, is there going to be like a little added flair on it to let us know it's Caleb Williams? Or is he going to get the same deuces emoji that everyone else has? Everyone is waiting on this, but uh, they are brilliantly playing this right now out in Southern Cal when it comes to uh, social media. So that's the update on Caleb Williams. The update is there's no update. What about Jackson Dart? There's more and more smoke around Jackson Dart that makes me think that I feel pretty secure in our prediction of Ole Miss. Now, this is not official, but as you know, we have talked about Jackson Dart for the last three or four shows. Uh, this is the quarterback transfer from USC, and it looks like it's down to Oklahoma and Ole Miss and, and Brigham Young. We have told you that. And it also looks like he may be attached at the hip with Michael Trigg, who's a tight end transfer from USC. Uh, they visited Norman. They visited Brigham Young. They have visited Ole Miss. So they've gotten the visits out of the way, which stands to reason we are shrugging right now because we really don't know what the holdup is. We don't know what the timetable is. I really feel good about Ole Miss. Ole Miss, just folks around the program, they feel really good. And they certainly would tell you if we had, him, if we had Lane Kiffin on the show right now, and we inject a truth serum into him, we probably wouldn't need to. He's pretty forthright. And he's invited on the show whenever he wants to come on. He would probably tell you, yeah, I think we're going to get him. But if we don't, we're not going to sweat it because we certainly feel we've done all we can to land him and probably them, probably both of them being Dart and Trigg. You know, the quarterback transfer market in and of itself is wild. Look at the screen. If you're watching on YouTube, these are the 2022 Heisman odds from Caesars Sportsbook. Now, granted, that's a long way away, but it's fun to look at these sorts of things. The highlighted names out of this top 10 right now constitute quarterbacks who have transferred. So whether you got JT Daniels, Quinn Ewers, Dylan Gabriel, Casey Thompson, Spencer Rattler, Caleb Williams, all those names are among the Heisman top 10 betting favorites, odds on favorites for this upcoming year. And all of them have either transferred or are currently in the portal, i.e. Caleb Williams, i.e. Uh, JT Daniels. And look, you do not see Dart's name on there. You don't see Jackson Dart. I can assure you, if in the next five minutes or five hours or five days, he lands at Ole Miss, if they don't put him on there, you can write his name in pencil. Because Jackson Dart is certainly one of the top 10 favorites in the Heisman race if he gets added to a Lane Kiffin offense, which, by the way, has also added other pieces. I think we'll end up doing an Ole Miss transfer portal segment on this show eventually. Also, Arkansas not to be outdone, added Latavius Brinney today. He is a former defensive back now, former safety from the University of Georgia. This is not a guy who rode the bench. Brinney started, he started 11 games for him. I think he played in 13 games for him this year at safety. This is the fifth four-star player that Arkansas has added from the transfer portal. I'm going to repeat that sentence because it's a big deal. This is the fifth four-star player that Arkansas has added from the transfer portal in this cycle. Arkansas They've got a couple of spots in the secondary to fill, so this is very important. They're not merely adding depth. Brenny's probably going to be an immediate contributor for them, you know, barring injury or whatnot. But also, this coincides with a big recruiting weekend up there, and we're going to be talking about this more and more as we get sort of out of portal season and then we approach spring. Uh, you know, this Wednesday we got a five-star reveal show coming up, for example, for the 2023 class. Arkansas is really killing it in 2023 recruiting. We got the 2022 signing day coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll be down in Fort Lauderdale for another big show. But the 2023 class is already coming together for them. You know, they're ranked top five right now. Of course, you've got the cynic out there who would say, well, they won't be top five when it's time to actually put pen to paper next year. Look, maybe they're not. But remember when Penn State, Jesse, you remember this. You remember when your Penn State and Nittany Lions, they were number one for a long time. And I made a pretty big deal about it. Tweeted out a couple of times, Hey, congrats. As of this moment, Penn State's ranked number one. And everyone said, well, they're not going to finish number one. Okay, but they're like six right now. That's a big deal. You, you, don't, 
you don't formally go from rank number one to outside the top 30. So the point is, unless all the kids decommit, I can pretty much guarantee Arkansas is going to have a nice, solid 2023 recruiting class. And as you know, it is our personal belief on here that we are blending those two concepts. We are blending the players you're adding traditionally, and we are certainly combining that with the guys you get out of the portal. Arkansas is killing it. Arkansas destination program. What about Jermaine Burton? This is huge news. This has happened in the past hour to hour and a half. Former now Georgia wide receiver Jermaine Burton, he has portaled. It is a verb. It has been a verb uh, ever since we established it as a verb about a month ago. Jermaine Burton has portaled from Georgia to Alabama. This is in addition to them adding Jermaine Gibbs, who was the big time running back from Georgia Tech. This is in addition to them adding Eli Ricks, who's a five-star corner out of LSU. Nick Saban said once upon a time, feels like an eternity ago. It was only like a year ago. Someone asked him about the transfer portal and he shrugged and he said, we'll probably lose some good players. We'll probably add some great players. And Alabama's lost a lot of good players this cycle to the transfer portal. I don't think they were exactly fighting on those guys' ways out the door, respectively. But now you've seen what's come in the door. Jermaine Burton just made a multi-million dollar decision as it relates to his future. More on that in a second. Gibbs was maybe one of the very best players in the ACC as a conference last year. And you didn't know a lot about him because he was playing for a subpar team at Georgia Tech. And Eli Ricks is one of the best defensive back prospects in the entire nation. And Nick Saban's just kind of added all of them. And here's what you don't know. What you don't have a way of knowing, but I can assure you, you can assume is reality, is how many guys are reaching out to Alabama every day who are currently on rosters looking for a spot who are probably either told, wait, or they're told, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. We may have offered you out of high school. You should have come then. Uh, this is exactly how Nick Saban told you this would play out. Now, what kind of addition is this? It is a surefire starter, future NFL, first, second round kind of talent. That's who Jermaine Burton is. Jermaine Burton is the kind of guy that if he's healthy, which he wasn't always at Georgia, but if he is healthy, he's going to go from being a solid, dependable receiver who never played with a star quarterback to being a 1,500 plus yard reception kind of guy in yardage with Bryce Young. And he's also going to be a guy who no one's talking about really in the next year's mock drafts right now to doing exactly what Jamison Williams just did. He does not mirror the skill set of Jamison Williams, but he doesn't need to either. Jamison Williams came in and they had a bunch of true freshmen aside from John Mechie. Now Jermaine Burton comes in and Jermaine Burton is going to be a rock solid known commodity piece in that receiver room. And now you got a year's worth of seasoning on guys like a Jai Hall. You got a year's worth of seasoning on Jojo Earl and Christian Leary and Ja'Cory Brooks. They're gonna have a really good receiver room. I'm not, it's question mark tight end to me. They got Latu back. They don't have a traditional stretch the field tight end. Alabama's gonna be really, really good next year. I know that shocks all of you, but uh, Nick Saban just made another big pickup. The transfer portal is on fire. Now here's the good news. If you don't like all the talk about the portal, eventually this will subside because the drop ad dates, especially for programs that are on the uh, semester system, that's coming up very soon. The quarter system programs, they can go a little bit deeper, uh, but I, I think that by the time we get into February, this will start to subside and then there'll be another huge wave after spring practice. And that is the transfer portal. Uh, look at it as of uh, Sunday night, January 23rd, the year of our Lord, 2022. Let's talk moods, shall we? We've all got moods and they uh, vary changing with the tide, so to speak. The Mood Tracker rolls into Columbia, South Carolina tonight. I was over on the Big Spur earlier today and I did my usual drop in. Hey, how you guys been doing? Let's talk about the mood. The mood around South Carolina football is what right now? And we got a ton of great responses over there and I would encourage you, if you're a South Carolina fan, you haven't participated. It's not like I'm gonna lock the thread after the show's over, so I'm having a lot of fun over there with those guys, but South Carolina football is so clearly in a better position right now than anyone out there could have expected after year one under Shane Beamer. I know that you have the usual critics out there. Uh, they're probably Clemson fans or Georgia fans or Florida fans. You cannot expect them to give a rational take on your program. Uh, so aside from the casual detractors whose opinions because of other affiliation you just need to eliminate from your life, how can any neutral observer or actual South Carolina fan look at the football program right now and say anything other than, wow, they're way ahead of the schedule I had in mind, at least. That's exactly where South Carolina football is. And so I was scrolling through all the responses and I was gauging a couple of my buddies who are South Carolina fans. 
And the mood around South Carolina football right now is strapped in. That's what they are. There's excitement, but there was excitement when Shane Beamer got hired. I wouldn't say everyone was strapped in yet because there were a couple of big fears. No one wanted to talk about them, but you had them in the back of your mind. But as far as I can tell, those fears have kind of been eliminated. I'll talk about the fears in a second, but I just want for argument's sake and for context to remind you, Shane Beamer's hire was so critical because Shane Beamer was the guy the fan base wanted. This is not a situation where the fan base backed one of their own, but then the administration went and hired a guy that checked more of their boxes. And so a guy came in and he was needing to prove it to the fan base and win the fan base over. Shane Beamer didn't have to win the fan base over because Shane Beamer is one of them. So he came home to them. It's a culture fit. It's the same thing Arkansas did with Pittman. So they were already thrilled and ecstatic. But then what did he do in year one? They didn't have to swallow a two-win season. They won seven games. And why is that important? Context, folks. The over-under win total started at three and a half. And it was four by the time the season kicked off. So they went over by a solid three games. They beat Florida in year one under Beamer. They beat Auburn in year one under Beamer. They capped it with a Duke's Mayo Bowl win, memorable Duke's Mayo Bowl win, over North Carolina. Can you imagine telling a Gamecock fan that before the season? Oh, and by the way, quarterback was a total disaster for him, a mess all year. And now, afterwards, they've gone and attacked the transfer portal, and they've got Spencer Rattler, and they got Stogner, and they're not done in all likelihood with doing that. So they got a little Michigan State vibe about them, to be honest with you, in the way that they've chosen to attack the portal. But the biggest fears being eliminated are just this. Shane Beamer comes in, the crowd wanted him. The crowd's ecstatic because they got him, but there's a big fear. You do not win football games at a podium. You don't win them during spring, and you certainly don't win them on Twitter. So they hit home runs on all those fronts. Everyone loves when Shane Beamer talks. Uh, the guy's very influential, he's very interactive. So Shane Beamer plays well. But we've seen coaches play well in those arenas, and they end up sucking on Saturdays. Shane Beamer, he did all the former, but then when it came time to prove it in the latter category, they did it. They won seven games in year one. They're recruiting well. They are killing it in the transfer portal. They have exceeded every possible expectation out there. And what happened is you eliminated the biggest fear. The biggest fear to me about any new coach, Shane Beamer included, is what happens when the sugar high wears off. Because everyone loved it when he came in the door. I did too. We loved it as a, as a program here. Uh, our program, we loved it for their program. Because we love South Carolina. I love the way that he handled it. Very interactive, very open. The program's very open. But the concern was, what if they get in the season and they just get drug? And it's, it's so far beyond the pale that it's really hard to get people to still buy in. That's totally eliminated. Totally eliminated. And so now that's why everyone's strapped in. You can be excited, but still be a little bit hesitant. Now that you've seen some of those boxes get checked in year one, you feel very confident that, well, if we did that in year one, we're, not gonna take four, we're certainly not gonna take 14 steps back in year two. And we've already seen sort of the positive context boxes being checked too. Staff's all in. I think they're turning that into a destination for coaches, by the way. I feel the same way about North Carolina, North Carolina and South Carolina. I feel like those have become secret destination spots for assistant coaches. Not that they weren't always, but it used to be that assistant coaches looked and just flat out thought, there are things I want to accomplish professionally that I may not be able to at South Carolina. I don't know if they think that way anymore. You can say the same thing about Arkansas. I don't know that they're thinking that way anymore. Now, what do you look for moving forward is you look for the same thing week over week, year over year, incremental improvement. Uh, they need more depth, places like defensive end. A lot of folks on the Big Spur were talking about this. There was a lot of back and forth about offense from a philosophical standpoint. Do you keep your offensive coordinator? You know, do we like the way things are progressing offensively? Here's what I'll tell you. I choose to look at that from a much higher altitude than maybe you guys, because you watch every play of every game. I get all that. But you just, you got to understand that stuff, if you've got the right coach and you've got the right culture in the house, it will work itself out. And if the head coach endorses the guy and believes in the guy, maybe it works out. But here is the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is you don't have the right fit. If you've got the right fit at head coach and you got the right culture, this other stuff falls into place. Maybe not overnight, but this other stuff falls into place. South Carolina folks, as they should be, are now strapped in. And I'll tell you, outside of Georgia, who else are you looking around the East and just immediately 
penciling in a loss to. And you may not be doing that with Georgia either, but you're not doing that with anyone else. You're not even doing it with Clemson right now. Clemson looks more vulnerable than they have in several years. And I know for a long time, from the, like the 2015 through 2020 era, people looked at the direction of these two programs respectively, and you thought to yourself, there's no way South Carolina will ever come back. Yeah, they will. Yeah, first off, they don't have to go all the way up there and catch Clemson. Clemson could come back to the pack. Stranger things have happened. Well, now, you know, you sort of see two things happening at once. You see one program trending one way, one program, I'm not going to say trending because it's still very, very small sample size, but Clemson looks to have maybe begun a little bit of a coming back to the pack or maybe, you know, some overturn turnover in the program. It's a good time to be a South Carolina Gamecock fan. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot of opportunity here. And uh, that Shane Beamer contract, by the way, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to talk about this specifically, but I'll just, I'll put it out there. Whatever Shane Beamer's making right now, it's on the lower end of the SEC totem pole. I'm not going to sit here and wave the flag for folks to get raises because if I do that, I'm going to open my DMs and they're going to be 37 coaches asking me to advocate for them. It's already happened a few times without me talking about it. I will just independently say this. Whatever the dollar amount is that Shane Beamer's making right now, I think in very short time he will be making more than the current dollar figure he makes. Have I been clear? I think I've been pretty clear. So it's a good time to be a South Carolina fan. Got a lot of places that we want to get to this spring to visit. South Carolina is definitely one of them. I probably should arrange that with them before I just say it out loud on air. All right, a couple of things that I want to hit on our way out the door. I'm really enjoying this late kick Q&A session that we do. I appreciate you being tuned in live, by the way. Uh, If you're watching the replay, thank you for that as well. Make sure, a couple of things before we do the Q&A and get out of here. Make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening now, whether it be Apple Pods or Spotify Pods, we can now get five-star reviews on Spotify. A lot of you wanted it for a long time. They finally inexplicably waited until now to add that feature. The five-star reviews, they really help us. All right, Jesse, let's tee it up. We got two quick questions. Nice, compact 40-minute show tonight, and we'll get out of here. Uh, The first question is something that I, I kind of teased a little bit earlier. First question here tonight, what's the fair market value for Kirby Smart's contract? That's from Emery Dave. Interestingly enough, when I was in Indianapolis for the national championship game, I had a conversation with someone sort of in the know about these sorts of things. Now, the reason earlier that I said I don't think coaching contracts on average have peaked, I think those numbers are going to keep going up, is number one, because the money in this sport continues to balloon. We haven't seen a crest there. So naturally, I think you'll see a little correlation with the way that coaching contracts trend. But there are also way more caveats. And there are way more perks and benefits in contracts today than there ever have been before. Now, you pay attention to the dollar figure in all likelihood, or maybe you pay attention to the dollar figure and then the bonuses. Here is what some of the coaches have gotten very, very wise to. Lincoln Riley pulled off a huge coup when he signed with USC that may have gone under your radar or over your radar. Here's what Lincoln Riley did. He's getting a whole lot of money, but what he also got was unlimited use of the university private jet. I don't know how many of you are fluent in the language of private aviation, but that is worth millions upon millions of dollars. Now, that's not actual money on a check that's handed to Lincoln Riley, but it's huge. If I were Kirby Smart, and I'm talking to my agent, who is Jimmy Sexton, sure, we're going to get more money out of Georgia. I deserve to be paid right in the top 5% of this sport. But brother, if I've got a cap on the hours that I currently get on that university jet, and I have strong reason to believe as of this moment Kirby Smart still does, You can get affiliation with wheels up and net jets and all that. Forget about having to go third party. You go to that university and you say, here's what we're going to take. I'm going to take a little bit of a new raise in the form of a monetary figure that you give me. I want that plane. That's what's important to me. And I don't just want it for me. Lincoln Riley didn't just get that plane at USC for him. His family, anytime they want it, they got it. Kirby Smart, anytime my family... And my extended family and extended, extended family and my cousin Jethro down in Waycross, who I've never met or I've just heard rumors about. Anytime they want that jet, we got that jet. That is what I would attack tomorrow, maybe even later tonight if I were Kirby Smart. But just in terms of dollar amounts, absolutely. He's represented by the right guy. Uh, He knows good and well what the score is. You will see a revised contract in the not-too-distant future for Kirby Smart. And he deserves every penny of it. I mean, how... 
what is the monetary value of a national championship in Georgia? Do you want to guess on that? There will be economic studies done in that state. You can't do them right now because the impact is still being felt, but I'm very excited for you to see a couple of years from now because I saw him do it at Bama the first time Saban won a title there. And I remember the number was just astronomical. And then I listened to a dean of one of the departments from the actual college in Alabama. And he was talking about what happened to admissions and what happened to applications once Alabama won a national title. You guys would have your mind totally boggled, which is also now a verb, if you understood the true financial impact of winning a championship. It is outside this world, astronomical. Let's move on. Next question, final question. This one caught my eye. This one's from Alec. Alec said, is the ACC the best conference for quarterback play in 2022? Hartman, Van Dyke, uh, Brennan Armstrong, Keaton Slovis, they are a strong top four. I'm going to answer this bluntly. Uh, I'm going to round off the R there. So I'm going to answer this bluntly. The ACC has got to prove it to me until further notice. Because we came in this past year. Do you know that the ACC, I think the number was either 12 or 13 of 14 programs, had returning quarterbacks? And think about what college football this year was. If you just throw this out there from 30,000 feet, and I were to tell you, you know, the big programs are going to be a little bit down this year. Ohio State's not going to even play for a conference title. Oklahoma, preseason number one, is not going to be remotely what you think they're going to be. There's going to be an open window. Now the team that eventually wins the national title is going to have a former walk-on quarterback. They're going to win using an older school style. Alabama is going to, relatively speaking, have one of their lower caliber playoff teams that Nick Saban's had. And then I also told you the ACC is going to have 13 of 14 returning quarterbacks. You would have thought this is a golden opportunity for this conference to rise to a level that many people didn't think they were capable of for several years. And they didn't. They didn't at all. There was nothing special about ACC football this year. Uh, none of the programs that stood an opportunity to take a step up really took a step up. Now, Pitt did. Wake Forest did. But that didn't happen on the playoff scale. That happened just off the periphery. Kind of you had to use your peripheral vision to see that. So I'm not saying it was a failure on the fronts. So what I'm saying is when I tell you that kind of dynamic exists in a conference in what is a relatively down year for mega powers in college football, you would swear to yourself, if not Clemson, certainly North Carolina with Sam Howell's going to step up or, or certainly any of a number of these programs. You saw the names there and the names were even more impressive and the list was even deeper this past year. It just didn't happen. So, you know, we can look at that list, Tyler Van Dyke, Keaton Slovis. Sure, we can look at that list. And we can say, oh, those are nice names. Brennan Armstrong, that's nice names. Who's taken over a game on that list? Maybe they're capable of it. They haven't shown the propensity to do it yet. So that's not an intimidating list to me. I don't, I don't think that that alone tells me the ACC is going to have the market cornered on quarterback play this coming year. Just the way I see it. Sorry if it uh, upsets anyone's feelings. Okay, a nice, succinct show tonight. Uh, we appreciate Roger Goodell, you know, uh, probably texted me a couple of times, telling me to wrap the show up. The NFL kind enough to just sync this up right with their halftime, and now they've probably started the third quarter, so we're going to get out of here. Thank you so much for watching the show. Make sure you like and subscribe on the way out. For producer Jesse, for our PAs, for Director Colin, I'm Josh Pate. Have a great start to your week, and God bless.